I realized that discipline is not really about willpower and determination. Discipline is really about honesty. It's about how honest am I being? It's easy to justify being stuck, staying stuck, sloppy behavior when you are asking yourself sloppy questions. We can't be sloppy six days out of the week and expect to somehow be strong on the seventh day. You will experience resistance to the degree that that project is important. So the more important it is, the more resistance you will feel. Because what I've seen and what I've experienced in my own life is that when you have that happiness going from the inside out, it's easier to tune into your why. It's easier to ask yourself those stronger questions, to chip away at the distractions, to disrupt the status quo. When we talk about being stuck, what that means is you are able to relate to one of the symptoms of feeling overwhelmed by your daily responsibilities. Maybe you have a hard time hearing what your heart is saying. And when you hear people like me saying, just follow your heart, take a leap of faith on what your heart is telling you to do, you're confused. You're not quite sure. What does that even mean? I can't hear my heart. Or most of the voices that you are hearing inside are not particularly inspiring. And so it's better to just kind of stay where you are in your current status quo. If you do hear your heart, perhaps you are too scared to take a leap of faith because people who have put themselves out there and it didn't go well, and you have these sort of cautionary tales in your head. And so there's that low grade fear around making significant or meaningful changes in your life. To some extent, maybe. Maybe some of you feel like you're a boat without a rudder and you're just kind of bobbing around directionless in life. And then when something happens in the news, then you feel like you need to give all of your attention to that. And then when something else happens, you have to give your attention to that, but you're not really giving a lot of attention to you and what you want to do. And then if that keeps happening over time, it can start to feel like you're falling behind while everyone else around you seems to be moving ahead and they're confident and they're clear and they have more focus than you. Another symptom is you may spend the majority of your time doing things that you don't particularly love, that doesn't light you up inside, but you feel like I have to do this to make my ends meet because I have responsibilities and obligations, and family, or you lack motivation. You feel like you are prone to procrastination you don't have a whole lot of guidance side of maybe the occasional book that you read or a YouTube video or something like that. And so we're going to talk about all of those points. We're going to address that. And I, my goal is for you to walk away from this workshop with some very clear action steps that you can employ today that can start to make tangible differences in your day-to-day experiences. But first, I want to start by telling you about me. <laughs> so this is a picture of me from uh, high school. Believe it or not, I was about, I don't know, 16 years old in that picture. God, I look so young <laughs> for a 16-year-old. But I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama. And I don't know how many of you all have been to Alabama or if you're in Alabama now, but back in those days, back in the mid 1980s, early 1990s, when I was there at that time, there was probably more snowstorms in Alabama than there were meditators. And for those of you who don't know, Alabama's in the deep South, so there's never any snowstorms. <laughs> but I was so far removed from everything that I'm doing today that I had no clue which direction my life was taking me in. So I took the conventional route. I went to college in Washington, D.C. I had an aspiration to work in advertising. I was fortunate in getting a job in advertising directly after college in Chicago. I stayed at that job for a total of three months. That was my one and only real job, real meaning nine to five, office job in my entire life. After about two and a half months, I got this urge to switch things up. I figured, hey, this office job is going to be here 
forever. I can always come back to it. And that was really my first leap of faith. And it was scary. It was a very scary one. And I wrote about this in my book, Knowing Where to Look. I opened the book talking about getting this one-way ticket to Paris, France, and all of the different coincidences that came into play that helped me to understand that when you can hear some sort of internal urging telling you to take a leap of faith and you do so, the net will appear. So that was my first time having that experience. And it was pivotal because it gave me a little more confidence in doing things like that throughout my entire life. Well, anyway, fast forward, that led me to what I'm doing today. And I'm going to tell you little stories about my journey as we go throughout this workshop. But now, today, I'm known as this meditation teacher who has written books and I've given TED Talks. My TED Talk is nearly a million views. And I've been written up in the New York Times and People Magazine and Time Magazine and all these places. I've had a chance to work with people from all walks of life. Personally, I've worked with thousands of people. Uh, digitally, I've worked with millions of people. And I have been writing a lot and speaking a lot about how to create change from the inside out, how to become more fulfilled internally, and basically how to bring those really complex and complicated spiritual principles down to earth, out of the clouds, into real life, onto the kitchen table so that we can understand them and so that we can simplify them enough to be able to embody them and to, uh, to stay committed to them. And one of my surprising truths that I personally discovered uh, early on was that in order to have some of these practices going in the background that will create momentum and movement in your life, to some extent, you have to enjoy them. You have to enjoy them. And so my main book about how to establish inner peace and fulfillment, Bliss More, Succeeding in Meditation Without Really Trying. And that was really important for me to discover because meditation was something that I struggled with a lot. In fact, I would say that I felt very stuck in meditation. So I'll tell you some stories about that as well. All right, so let's get on to it. The five proven ways to get unstuck in life. So we've defined what it feels like to be stuck. And obviously, nobody wants to be stuck in their life. We have to understand what needs to happen from the inside out in order to create more movement and momentum in life. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. So when I first started getting out into the what I call the real world, which is what happened after college and after having that job that I told you about that only lasted for a few months, I was a bit directionless. I didn't really know what exactly I wanted to do. And looking back now, in hindsight, what I was doing inadvertently was I was following what I was naturally curious about. And the first place that curiosity led me was to the, the modeling industry. I became a model. And you see here on the left, there's a picture of me with this beautiful young model. And it was a gap modeling campaign. <laughs> and this was probably the pinnacle of my modeling career. That was a billboard that was all over the world. It happened to live in New York City at the time. It was on billboards. It was on buses. The first time I saw it, though, I was working in a restaurant because prior to this campaign happening, I wasn't doing that well, and meaning I couldn't survive off of modeling full time. That job didn't actually pay a whole lot of money. It was only paying a couple of thousand dollars. I was actually making more money working at the restaurant. But when I saw the billboard that day that I was working at the restaurant, literally waiting tables, I said to myself, you know what? 
this is an opportunity for me to take another leap of faith. And there was a curiosity within me that said to me, what would happen if I were to go all in on this fashion thing? Because up until that point, I was getting the occasional job and I was very much relying on my waiting tables job to make my ends meet. And again, I wouldn't say I felt stuck in that job, but I felt comfortable in that job. I could pay all my bills. I was really good at it. And I didn't hate it, but it's not something I wanted to necessarily make a career out of. So I was in that kind of space where I didn't have to get out of it, but I saw this as an opportunity and that lit me up inside. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to take the leap and see what happens. And so nowadays, when I do a lot of my writing and speaking, I talk about following your curiosity like you're being paid for it. And eventually, that's what will start to happen. And so when I did that, I began getting modeling gigs that paid me more than the waiting table gigs. Now, obviously, we can call this coincidence. I don't know. I'm sure there is some aspect of determination that comes with putting yourself out there or burning the boats or whatever you want to call it. But when you get really clear that you're not here to wait tables or you're not here to work in advertising or you're not here to do the thing that you've been doing and that's not really where your curiosity is guiding you anymore, then you ask yourself, where is it guiding me? Because the way the heart works is when you take action in the direction of whatever's on your heart, then you are going to experience your own version of those coincidences that come together. Now, again, I didn't just jump and then everything sort of fell into place. There were probably, I don't know, a thousand other steps in between there. And what you're seeing right now in this gap photo is the sort of culmination of a bunch of other leaps that I took while I was waiting tables. And then when it got to that point, that was like my indicator that, okay, now it's time to finally leave this other thing. You have a little bit of money saved up, but not enough to necessarily live full time indefinitely. But this is the thing with taking leaps of faith. It's called a leap of faith because you're not going to know how it turns out, but you're trusting that your heart is never going to lead you astray. There's no such thing as a leap of certainty. And one of the reasons why we get stuck is because we're waiting for certainty. There's never going to be a day when you have certainty. And again, I didn't think I was going to be a model for the rest of my life, but that's where I was at that time in my life. And I suspected that was going to lead to whatever the next thing was. So cut to the other picture on the right. You see a picture of me sitting with a cloth wrapped around me and what they call a dhoti in India. That's my very first meditation retreat that I was hosting in India. So you can imagine <laughs> all of the decisions that came between that modeling photo and this photo in India, which took place in 2014. So from the modeling stuff, I was in the gym almost every day working out. And I remember being upstairs in Equinox in New York City, and I was doing some shoulder presses and I see these attractive women all gathering outside of the group exercise room. And they start filing in and my hormone said, go follow them into that room. So I go into the room and I end up in my very first yoga class. I had no idea what yoga was about or anything about yoga, but that was my very first class. And I actually hated it the very first time. I like being the only guy in the class, let me be honest, but I hated the actual yoga. And I went back again and tried a different teacher. And over time, I started to actually crave the yoga practice itself. And so that natural curiosity started me down a new path towards something that was very different from the modeling stuff. And eventually, I stopped being a model who was practicing yoga at, in the evenings. And I became a yogi who was dabbling in modeling during the day. And one of my yoga teachers invites me to a meditation class one night. 
And I went to that and I absolutely hated it. I hated meditation because I didn't feel like anything was happening. And that lasted for a few years, but I kept going back to it because I was just curious about it. And I had no idea where it was leading me, but I just kept showing up. I was trying different types of teachers. And this is back in the mid nineties. So there weren't any apps. There weren't any uh, YouTube videos. YouTube wasn't around at that time, but it was just about continuing to follow my curiosity. So when I say know your why, what I'm really saying is when you have something that makes you curious, that is your why. You don't have to make it any more complicated than that, right? And also, you don't want to feel shame or judgment around the thing that you're curious about. All you have to do is keep taking the next step in the direction of your curiosity, and that becomes your why, and that's something that you can do starting today. Everybody here has something that they're curious about. The reason why we don't normally explore that is because we feel like, oh, this is not leading to me making more money, or this is not going to sound right to my friends and my family, and I'm afraid of other people's opinions. And so obviously those are obstacles that we have to eventually get over, but that's going to help us moving in the direction of getting unstuck and creating a little bit more momentum in the thing that we think that we are here to do for now. I'm using my words very specifically here. We think that we're here to do for now. You don't have to know for certain, this is what I'm here to do. And I think when we put that kind of pressure on ourselves, we can easily talk ourselves out of it. Moving on, the next principle for getting unstuck, asking yourself stronger questions. What do I mean by asking yourself stronger questions? Okay, so going back to my childhood, I was addicted to sugar. Again, growing up in Alabama, I ate food for mainly two reasons. One, to get full. Two, because it tasted good. Nutrition was not a consideration where I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama. And so one of my favorite meals to eat was just cereal. I love Frosted Flake cereal. The only problem with it is that it wasn't sweet enough. <laughs> it wasn't sweet enough. So I would actually sprinkle more sugar onto the Frosted Flakes, if you can believe that. And in my 20s, I decided to stop eating sugar. But whenever I would try to kick the sugar habit, I would start asking myself what I now realize looking back was a sloppy question. I would ask a question like, is eating this one little cookie going to kill me? How many people have asked themselves those kinds of questions? Is doing this one little thing going to kill me? Is skipping this one little workout going to kill me? Is watching one more episode going to kill me? <laughs> right? And eventually, when I got serious about my health, the way I got to that point was I had to start asking myself stronger questions. And I probably got this out of some spiritual book that I was reading at the time, but I changed the question from is, oh, I tell you exactly where I got this question from. I had a friend, a really good friend of mine. She was 36 years old. She had cancer. She had breast cancer. And I would go to the doctor with her on occasion. And she had a habit of eating Snicker bars, like mainlining Snicker bars. Now, obviously, there's no cancer treatment or protocol for diet that involves eating four or five Snicker bars a day. So she goes to the doctor one day and she's telling her naturopathic doctor who's treating her for her cancer about her diet. And he's like, what are you eating? She goes, I'm eating all these Snicker bars every day. And he says, you're asking yourself, sloppy questions. You're asking yourself, is eating this one Snicker bar going to kill me? And the answer absolutely is no. He said, what I want you to start doing is I want you to start asking yourself stronger questions. Instead of asking, is this one Snicker bar going to kill me? I want you to ask, is this Snicker bar going to help me heal myself? And she told me about that conversation and it really changed things. And I started asking myself questions is eating this one cookie going to help break my addiction to sugar? The answer is the same, no, but it led to completely different results. And so the lesson was very simple. Number one, it's easy to justify being stuck, staying stuck, sloppy behavior when you are asking yourself sloppy questions. 
right? Asking sloppy questions is a bad habit. It's an unsustainable habit, just like eating sugar, eating processed sugar is an unsustainable habit, right? And we can't be sloppy six days out of the week and expect to somehow be strong on the seventh day. And then finally, asking stronger questions is a habit that is worthy of strengthening. And so that is one of the ways where you can dial in the fundamentals so that you can start eating better, you can start drinking more water, you can start moving with more consistency, even if it's just walking, you can start a meditation practice. All of these daily habits are what helps you stay in tune with your heart, your mind, and your body. It's very hard to get unstuck if you are disconnected from your body because you're putting a bunch of junk in your body or you're drinking a bunch of, of neurotoxins or you're not in tune with what's happening in your heart because you don't have a consistent daily meditation practice, et cetera. If you are struggling with meditation, I wrote the book, Bliss More, which you can also download on Spotify for free if you have an account with Spotify. It's an audio version of it. And it will walk you through step-by-step step how to get a daily meditation practice off the ground. But the fundamentals are important. And it starts with asking yourself stronger questions. So I started this uh, nonprofit back in 2014 called The Shine, which began as a question. I had stopped drinking at that point. I kicked the sugar habit at that point, And I wasn't really going out that much because I didn't want to be around a lot of people drinking alcohol. I didn't have a problem with that. I just wasn't curious about it anymore. And so I was asking, when is somebody going to create something for people who don't like to drink a lot? And eventually I realized I was asking myself a sloppy question. Instead of asking that question, I asked, why don't I do something about it? Why don't I create something? And again, we could overwhelm myself, ourselves thinking about some big, massive event, but I thought, you know what, let me just go check out this dance studio that I could potentially rent. And so I went to this dance studio, found out it was $50 to rent it. I sent out an email to some friends. About a dozen friends came and I called it The Shine, which was a name that sort of came to me in and around meditation. And I made tea for the event. I taught meditation in the event. I gave a little spiritual talk in the event. I created a question of the night where people can come and answer like, who's your biggest hero or What's one place you like to go on vacation? And they wrote that on their name tags. And it was a way for people to connect, an icebreaker. Because I personally hate going to events where you don't know anybody and everyone's sort of cliquish and you just kind of feel like, you know, a fish out of water. And I didn't want other people to have that experience. So I was just naturally curious about these kinds of things. And just question by question by question, I ended up having this event and I did it a few times. It was completely free. I didn't ask anybody for anything. And then one night after an event, I thought to myself, hmm, what would happen if I were to take up a donation just to see how people value the experience? So we took up a donation the next event, got about 50 bucks. Then I came home and I said, I could reimburse myself for the event or I could give this 50, I think it was $55 to somebody at the next event and I can have them go out and give it away and do something good for the world. And I called it the Shine Challenge, the Shine On Challenge. So I did that and not realizing that question that led to that action would become the sort of pivot point that would create this hockey stick growth of this event that had regularly gotten 12, 15 people coming out for free. And giving away that money the next night, the donations tripled. And then the next time the donations tripled from that. And eventually the crowds grew to 300, 400 people. We were giving away $400. The Shine On Challenge became the sort of pivotal event. And the event got written up everywhere. The New York Times, NBC, ABC, all the media outlets. We had zero PR. Everything was organic. And that is what led to my next book deal, 
But again, I wasn't going into it thinking, oh, I'm going to get a book deal out of this. I'm going to grow this thing to hundreds of people. I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was just asking questions and I was following my curiosity and I was staying on my why and I was trying, I was really trying not to get distracted. So this is a big reason why we sometimes find ourselves getting stuck. It's not because we don't know what we want to do. It's because we don't have any willpower when it comes to staying focused on the thing that we say we want to do. And it reminds me of this story. I actually have it in my book, Knowing Where to Look. It's called Chipping Away for those of you who have the book, but it's a story about the David statue. Interestingly, there's a David statue replica here in Mexico City, but David statue was originally created by Michelangelo when he was 26 years old. And they gave him a block of imperfect marble to work with. And no other sculptors wanted to use it. And he accepted the challenge. And it took him two years. And he created this statue that is still heralded as a masterpiece. And when they asked him about his process, he said that he envisioned what he wanted the David statue to look like. And then he began just chipping away at everything that wasn't David. And so the same goes for the things that we want to do and the life that we ultimately want to create is we sometimes have a lot of ideas and we have a lot of people who we may want to hang out with and spend time with and a lot of TV shows, a lot of Netflix shows that we want to watch and stay current on and a lot of magazines and a lot of Instagram accounts that we want to follow, et cetera, et cetera. And so a part of getting unstuck requires us to start to chip away at anything that is not aligned with the things that we are most curious about. So we have our natural curiosities and then we have to kind of narrow that into, okay, what are the top two or three things that we're most curious about? Usually they're things that are going to move us further out of our comfort zone and toward our growth zone. And so then we have something that we're going to prioritize more than other things. And it's not to say you can never watch Netflix or you can never scroll through social media and things like that. It's just that you are consciously putting your attention more on the things that you are already naturally most curious about and everything else can have its place maybe once a week or twice a week or like that. But this is probably the only part that requires discipline because it's hard not to give in to short-term gratification. And so what I've done and what I encourage you all to do is you need to get rid of the things that you know are prone to lead you to procrastination. So for instance, about a year ago, I went through my social media and I probably had, I don't know, a thousand people I was following on social media, which normal, average. And I just started unfollowing people. And it wasn't personal. It was just, I was doing that for myself because I knew that I had a tendency to be on social media more often than I wanted to be on social media. And so I got it down to about 100 people. <laughs> and these were people whose accounts provided me with inspiration for the writing that I was doing and the speaking that I was doing and whatever else I was focusing on at that time. And so now, instead of scrolling and scrolling and saying, oh, wow, I forgot, I want to see what that person is up to. Now, the people that I follow, maybe five of them post on a daily basis, and I'm still on there and I'm still scrolling, but my scrolling sessions have dwindled down from 30 minutes to three minutes. And so I've given myself what I call the freedom of choicelessness. There's not a choice to keep doing it because I'm not even following that many people. And I'm not saying you have to do that, but maybe find your version of that, whatever it is, whatever the thing is that you are indulging in that you're feeling like is not really contributing to your ultimate curiosity because you're asking yourself stronger questions. That's an opportunity to scale back on that thing. And I have a podcast that I started in 2020, which I interview who I call ordinary people doing extraordinary things to make the world a better place. And 
if you ever go through any of my interviews, you'll see that there's a formula where I talk about childhood and then adolescent and then young adulthood. And I'm asking them questions about how they developed their passion for leaving the world a better place and how they pivoted away from the conventional thing to the thing that they're doing now that they're most curious about. And interview after interview, you're basically here the same thing that I'm talking about. You had to ask yourself stronger questions. You had to stop caring about what other people thought. You had to chip away at anything that was distracting from your process. And eventually you had to take a leap of faith because there's no such thing as a leap of certainty. And that would lead them to ultimately disrupting the status quo. And the status quo is whatever's going on right now that's making you feel stuck, right? So instead of trying to get rid of the things that are making you feel stuck, what you're doing is you're adding more things that are allowing you to feel useful. And this requires a loyalty to your heart. And I'm gonna give you an example of that because I don't know how many of you all have read any of my books, but this is my very first book, The Inner Gym. And The Inner Gym was a self-published book. I started the process in 2011 and I didn't finish the process until late 2014 and it came out in 2015. Now, like, why did it take three and a half years to get this book on the market? Because I wasn't being loyal to the things that I'm talking about. I wasn't asking the strong questions. I wasn't disrupting the status quo. I wasn't as clear with my why. I wasn't chipping away at the distractions. And so this book process kind of helped to reiterate all of these things that we're talking about in the sense that I kept taking time away from it. I would take weeks at a time, months at a time, even away from it. I would come back to it. I would have all this self-doubt. I'd have all this imposter syndrome. In other words, I felt stuck in the process. And it wasn't until I read Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art that I got the inspiration and the motivation to like really drill down and get this thing done. And the way I did it was, you may have heard me talk about this in interviews, but I sent a check for $4,000 to a really good friend of mine. And I also sent a contract along with the check. And I said, hey, I'm tired of working on this book. I'm gonna finish this book in three months from now by this date. And if I don't finish it by this date, then I want to give you this check and I want you to cash the check and you can use it for anything that has nothing to do with me. And he signed it and I signed it. And sure enough, as soon as I had something to lose, then I found the time to finally dedicate to all of the work that it would require to bring this book into the world. And I ended up finishing a week early in case I got sick or something, because I didn't want to have any chance of losing that kind of money, which I really couldn't afford to lose at the time. But then that's when I realized that discipline is not really about willpower and determination. Discipline is really about honesty. It's about how honest am I being with myself? So when I'm looking at the things that I say are important, are they really that important to me? Is watching one more Netflix episode really that important? Is it more important than the thing that I'm ultimately saying that I want to do? Or am I excusing myself from that by using these very important sounding excuses that no one will ever question me with because I know how to phrase them in such a way that makes them sound super important. Not realizing that I was self-sabotaging, I was getting in my own way, I was keeping myself stuck in that process. And if you haven't read The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, I highly recommend it. He's been on my podcast uh, more than any other guest. And he talks a lot about resistance and how we are prone to give in to resistance and He's been writing for like 60 years and he still experiences resistance. To this day, he's written all these best selling books, millions of copies sold. He still has resistance. So, if he's got resistance, then of course, it's not unusual for us to have resistance. And I think that one of the mental tricks that we play with ourselves is we tell ourselves, oh, resistance means that my spirit doesn't want me to do this. Like we misinterpret what resistance means. And what Stephen says, which I think is brilliant, he says, 
you will experience resistance to the degree that project is important. So the more important it is, the more resistance you will feel. And the willpower and the determination is not going to help you as much as being honest with yourself about that and then putting guardrails in place so that you're not subjecting yourself to your own worst tendencies when it comes to succumbing to short-term gratification, which is something that, again, we're all prone to do. I've certainly done it millions of times, and that's why I knew that check had to say $4,000 and not $1,000, because if it was just $1,000, it would not have gotten my full attention. So I needed it to be an amount that I was almost afraid to lose. It would really, really disrupt my life if I had lost that money, that kind of money. That was like more, that was twice more than the rent that I was paying at that time. And what I did unintentionally was I gave myself accountability. That ended up leading to the process for me writing other books and creating the other work that I've created since that time. Since reading War of Art, I've shifted away from being an amateur, which is what Stephen Pressfield refers to people who allow their short-term gratification to justify the resistance that they're feeling. And I went from that to becoming a professional. And I think to some degree, we all have to do that. We have to go from being an amateur to being a professional. And that requires us to either get help from a coach, from a trainer, from someone else that we can maybe send one of those checks to. <laughs> And we know what our worst tendencies are. We know what they are already because we've been using them over and over and over. And maybe it's even gotten to the point where we can delude ourselves by those tendencies, where we convince ourselves, oh, I don't have enough time, which is not true. And the way you know I don't have enough time or I can't do it right now is not true is that if somebody were paying you to do the thing that you're saying you don't have time for, all of a sudden you would make time for it. So if you would do it for money, if enough money was on the line and that would make you do it, then that means that I don't have time is not really an honest assessment of what's stopping you from moving forward with this project. Because again, it's not a question of, are there things that I'm interested in? Absolutely, there's some things that everybody's interested in, but we don't move in that direction because of our old stories, our old outdated beliefs, the ones that are no longer serving us. And here's another thought experiment. Any excuse that you use, if you were to imagine that somebody who owed you a good amount of money used that same excuse, would you buy it? If they said, oh, you know, I have a headache today. I'm sorry, I couldn't pay you back your $5,000. Oh, I'm sorry, I overslept today. I couldn't pay you back. You'd be thinking to yourself, well, you can come now. We can make it happen. You didn't let sleep stop you from borrowing the money. Why don't you just bring it back over right now? So I think that's an even better thought experiment. When you start telling yourself excuses, would you accept that same excuse from somebody who owed you $5,000, $10,000, $20,000, and they were past due by several months? Would you hear that excuse and go, yeah, okay, that makes sense. It's okay. Absolutely not. So that's what getting accountability means. And I would say this is the most important part of getting unstuck. All of the other things we can do on our own, relatively speaking, we can recognize our curiosity and that's wonderful. And this is the thing that I'm most curious about. We can train ourselves to ask ourselves stronger questions. We can chip away at whatever's not supporting those curiosities, and we can add activities in there that disrupt the status quo. But accountability is not the thing that we can do for ourselves. Self-accountability is the worst form of accountability because if you knew how to hold yourself accountable, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. You'd be busy doing the thing instead of being here on a getting unstuck <laughs> workshop. And so Accountability is important. I think that's the one that we probably underappreciate the most. And back in the pandemic, I obviously couldn't do my live 
trainings and workshops, which is something that I was doing at that time was live, live, live. And I even had a bias toward live events and against online experiences. But following my curiosity, okay, well, how else can I serve? How else can I be on my purpose or follow my why or whatever? The idea to create a community came about. And I called this community the Happiness Insiders. And so the Happiness Insiders was a way for me to create courses and challenges and master classes to help people remotely. And what ended up happening was I saw that people were going through these challenges and 70, 80% of those people who started the challenge were finishing the challenge. So one day my curiosity said, okay, well, find out what the average completion rates are. And I looked it up and it was like 3% of people who start an online course or challenge end up finishing it. So if a hundred people start, only three out of those 100 people finish. Well, in this community, 70 out of a hundred, 80 out of a hundred, we're finishing three month long challenges. And I realized that everything that I had been experiencing up until that point, struggling with meditation, struggling with yoga, not being able to see people in person, et cetera, learning how to simplify these concepts, these spiritual concepts, so people can get it right away. That allowed me to create curriculum that could really help people, even in their busiest day, to be able to find the light in these kinds of activities. And that became one of the ways that I could really help people. And so I got very passionate about it and continued creating courses to help transform people's experiences, their life experiences from the inside out. And so that's something that's been going on for the last three and a half years. We've got like a two-week free trial. If anybody wants to even just jump in there and just test it out, join the mindfulness triathlon, join the how to move on from a breakup masterclass, join the how to find your purpose masterclass, take the 108 day meditation challenge, healthy eating challenge, movement challenge. There's like dozens of these challenges and masterclasses that all have these super high completion rates. And you can get in there and you can have access to all of it. And that's just something that I have ongoing now. I do live meditations once a week. I give people access to a seven day meditation kickstart, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, I'm giving as many resources as possible for helping people cultivate happiness from the inside out because what I've seen and what I've experienced in my own life is that when you have that happiness going from the inside out, it's easier to tune into your why. It's easier to ask yourself those stronger questions, to chip away at the distractions, to disrupt the status quo. And it's easier to get accountability because you're not doing it to get happy. You're doing it because you're already happy and you want to maintain as much of that happiness as possible. Hey, really quickly. If you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. And then finally, I want to just help as many people as possible and leave you with as many resources as possible. I'm sure those of you who've been following my work over the last six months or so have seen that. I launched this year of transformation program, which is the sort of premium offer for helping people who really want that higher level of accountability when it comes to changing from the inside out. And it's a really cool program because what it involves is volunteering to take on a series of seven day mini challenges. And some of those challenges could be walking a certain number of steps or jogging learning a new dance, something that gets you out of your comfort zone. It could be going off of social media for a period of time. It could be learning origami. It could be practicing gratitude, taking a cold shower every day for seven days. It could be going without your phone for a period of time. And everything happens incrementally. So for instance, with going without your phone, you're not just going all day without your phone. The first day, you're only going a few hours without your phone. The second day, you're going maybe five hours without your phone. So you're kind of building up because I'm a big believer in the tortoise approach to change as opposed to the hair approach to change. But I've already had one cohort go through this year of transformation and it's broken down into phases. What I just showed you was phase one and you choose 
12 of those challenges to complete within 12 weeks. So one a week on average, and then you go to the next phase where the challenges become a little bit more involved. And that's really how transformation happens. The community provides you with the accountability, provides you with the community, provides you with the support. And I'm in there every day helping people ask stronger questions, helping them chip away at the distractions, helping them stay focused on the things that they're curious about, helping them continue to learn how to disrupt the status quo. And over the course of that year, my goal is for people to become self-sufficient in doing all of that for themselves. And so that's what that is about. And that's something that if you want it to be a part of the year of transformation, I have a QR code right here. If you are using a laptop, you can just aim your phone there. It'll take you to the information. You can read through the information. You can read through more of the challenges. There are things like doing stand-up comedy, writing your first book, starting your podcast, learning how to hand wash your clothes, going all day without complaining. Just all these things that people have said to themselves, hmm, that would be interesting if I were to try that. But again, we don't have accountability. We don't have community. We don't have support. So it just stays this idea that Maybe one day I will do this. And that one day just continues on indefinitely. And I think it was Napoleon Hill who said, a goal is a dream with a deadline. You want it to go further in getting unstuck. But if that's like, oh, no, that's too much light. I don't want to do all that. Then again, you can check out the community. The community is just very basic. You get two weeks for free. You don't have to pay anything. You do have to enter your credit card because that's just the way the platform works that I've created this on. But we send you lots of notifications to cancel your credit card before anything gets charged. But if you just want to get in there and poke around and see if this is something that can help you, because I'm only interested in things that can actually help in real world scenarios on your busiest day, not on the perfect day where you have your tea. I'm talking about the busiest day when kids are sick and it's raining and you're feeling like you're a day late and a dollar short. Can it work on that day? And if it can work on that day, then this is going to be something that you can indeed do indefinitely. So doing nothing continues to get you the same results that inspired you to join this workshop. And the way my AA friends put it, your best thinking got you to where you are right now. So if you're feeling stuck right now from your best thinking, then it will certainly help and be advantageous to get exposure to a community of people who are all dedicated to doing the things that you say you ultimately want to do. Everyone who joins my year of transformation automatically gets a lifetime membership to this Happiness Insiders community. So you have that going, plus you have me holding you accountable on a daily basis, plus you have bi-weekly coaching calls with me, plus you are a member of a pod of people where every other week you can connect with them and you all can hold each other accountable. Because be honest, in your normal life, even if you do practice meditation, if you, even if you do take a cold shower, you tell your friend, you tell your coworker, and what happens? Nothing. They don't care. Nobody cares. The only person who really cares is you. And that's one of the reasons why it could be so hard to get unstuck is because it feels like you're a lone wolf out there in the world because everybody else is so focused on themselves, right? And that's just how the world works. People are focused on themselves. So what's beautiful about these communities is that you have peers who are all doing the same things that you ultimately want to do. And that can be super powerful when it comes to consistency because they do care. When you go and report in the community, guys, I took my cold shower this morning. Guys, I made my origami just now. Guys, I went the whole day without complaining. They're like cheering you on. Yes, that's amazing. Incredible. I'm in there saying, man, that's incredible. What are you going to do next? And so that's one of the reasons why in the year of transformation, we have about a 90% completion rate so far. Everyone is on pace to finish almost at the same time. And it's incredible to see 
because this is, again, an offering that brings together all of my skill set, all of my ability to support and provide encouragement and inspiration. And if I can help you, if that resonates, I strongly encourage you to take a leap of faith, apply for the program. You do have to apply. I personally interview everybody who applies, and maybe you'll be starting with us next week. Maybe you'll be starting with us at some point in the future. But anyway, that concludes the webinar. And I want to thank you all so much for participating in this. I really, really appreciate your comments. I really appreciate your attention. And I hope that I get a chance to work with each and every one of you at some point in the near, near future, because I've seen so many lives just transform. And you never know, just like I didn't know when I left the modeling thing where that was going to lead me to, you never know where this is going to lead you to. But once you start incorporating these principles, you get really clear about your why. You start asking yourself those stronger questions. Once you start chipping away at whatever's not aligned, once you start disrupting your status quo, you are going to end up somewhere absolutely amazing. And this will be the beginning of your story where you talk about, hey, I started doing these challenges. I started getting these amazing ideas. I started taking just one step, taking the tortoise approach and look where I ended up. So we'll see. Anyway, if you join late, we're going to replay this very soon. Just check my Instagram for a link. We'll also send out a replay link on the email for those of you who have registered for it. And otherwise, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. And I look forward to hopefully connecting with you very soon. Big namaste to everybody. Thank you again. I really appreciate you. Go to The Year You Transform for more information about the program. Take care. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.